Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! The barbell hasn't changed in over 100 years. I can take a 25-pound plate, and we'll go out on the turf, and I'll, I'll have you hating life. We talk about straining your gut, pushing past that comfort level. I want a lot of energy. What better breeding ground is there for being a success in life than the weight room? Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chop Talk. I'm your host, Rob McKeefrey, and this is episode number 303. I want to thank you guys for listening each week. Appreciate those of you that like, share, comment. It just helps me help as many coaches as we can. Also highlight the great people that we have in the profession, like Fred here. I also want to thank our sponsors, our sponsor, um, Train Heroic. We truly appreciate them and all the, all the things that they've done uh, for when we were both at Eastern, as well as what they do now. Uh, first class organization, first class people, uh, top product, and uh, do some phenomenal work in the, in the in the profession as well. So if you're in the market, reach out to them. If uh, you don't, if you're not, then the next time you see them at a conference, just let them know how much you appreciate them being part of the show. Also, want to recognize our our new product, Play Pro, uh, an app in the App Store. Uh, if you have not checked that out, it is phenomenal. It's like Netflix for strength coaches. Um, and so tons of great content. Go to the App Store, download Play Pro. There is a free version, and then there's a paid version to get you access to our live streams of our clinics, the uh, Master's Academy courses, and a ton of other content. This week I'm joined by Fred Hale, uh, former staff member, um, personal friend, just a great guy that's in the profession, doing some fantastic things. Uh, he's a co-head strength coach at Eastern Michigan University, and man, just it's been a long time coming, but I'm glad you're on the show, brother. Yeah, super happy to be here. You know, excited to finally get a shot at the show. <laughs> no, it's it's uh, it's so it's so encouraging to me. It, you know, it's one of those things that when you when I first got in the profession, to ever think that I would have you know just this this massive group of people that I've had an, a hand in. Uh, their career in some way, shape, or form. And Fred started as an intern, went to a GA, um, but became an assistant, now the head strength coach. And, um, you know, it's just cool to see the journey and just so freaking like a proud, like a proud older brother, man. But appreciate you. Uh, you, you know, your background, you were a, a collegiate wrestler, collegiate football player. Um, you know, you kind of, you went, did, uh, you know, you worked for at Tennessee with us. You've been, a, you know, a handful of places, worked in private sector a little bit, which, which stop along the way had the biggest impact on the coach you are today. And, and this is in no way being a Brown user, but it was at, it was at the university of Tennessee. I got to walk in to see the staff that obviously working with you, Angelo James, Lee Taylor, Ben, the whole thing. And then the whole Olympic side. On top of that, Holly, uh, Heather, the whole deal, I got to see a room that was getting put together when you were putting that new uh, training center together. So that helped me there. That was a nugget I put in the pocket. Um, I got to see how to work with the team. Yeah, on the field it wasn't the way it needed to be, but in the weight room it was right. And, and the relationships that were built and were formed way before I ever got there. So that was a huge, huge learning opportunity for me. Yeah, it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's, you know, sometimes the product on the field doesn't always shape up, but, you know, we, we had put a lot of work in and, you know, it's great that you mentioned Tennessee. We'll get into that a little bit longer as we go, but, um, you know, we had a phenomenal, phenomenal group of coaches there. Mm -hmm. Before we jump into that, I want to talk a little bit, you know, biggest mistake. What, what's one of the biggest mistakes you've made in your, your coaching career and how you've learned from it? I would definitely have to say, you know, being that, gym rat <laughs> like uh and i say that in the best sense of the word but you know like hey this works for this work for here here and here so it's gonna work here or work for this person it'll work for me definitely doing my research and getting to know like okay this is these are my athletes this is what they can handle you know i can't just take something this is when i was young take it right off the shelf or take it right off the website and do it with them it's not gonna work you gotta know who you're working with and, and what your people can handle yeah, I think that's a common mistake when that, you know, when you're in that technician stage, right? I mean, everybody loves to train. That's why we get into it. We love researching and finding new ideas. And, you know, unless you fully understand something, putting it into your program and, and going, it's, it's uh, you know, oftentimes that leads to breaking a few, a few eggs along the way. And you got to be careful because um, obviously you've got precious, precious cargo in, in, in the weight room. 
you know, I talked a little bit about, you know, going private and collegiate. You, I think you had come, I can't remember if you came from a private to us or if you were, I know you left and went back to a private. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I mean, you know, I mean, you and I have talked about this and I don't think, you know, you, you would mind me sharing, but, you know, when you came in as a, as a, as a young coach, like you had a lot, you had a lot to, to learn. You had a lot to grow. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, even when I went to hire you back as an assistant, I was, you know, there was some question marks, right. And whether or not this was going to be the, the best hire or not. Now I'll say this, I'll preface all that by saying Fred has been the best assistant I've ever had. He's, a, he's been the best uh, and uh, a phenomenal, phenomenal coach. But, you know, early on it was, it was kind of rocky road, you know, and then, yeah. then you went back to, you went back to the private sector. Talk a little bit about those transitions, kind of like what you felt like you didn't have coming in, what you felt like you gained back by going to the private sector to where when you arrived at Eastern Michigan, you were, you were a well-rounded, ready to go coach. I, I definitely have to say when I left, you know, when I left Tennessee to go to the private sector working in Pittsburgh, it, you know, yeah, I could, I could coach a group. I could coach a, a you know, a couple guys here and there, but now I have to worry about the entire, the entire facility. So the maintenance, the cleaning, the scheduling of athletes, the, the budget, what, how much money I'm bringing in, you know, how much bringing in I'm, myself, my, uh, my staff, how much they're bringing in. And then when I went from the private back to Eastern, I had, a, I had a grasp of all that. Now everything slowed down. And then I had a, I knew how to manage my time so much better. Like I was saying in the private sector, you're going, 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 going. If you're not training, you're making sales calls. You're setting schedules. So now when I get to Eastern, you're like, okay, we're just, I'm working with football. I'm working with volleyball. And I, I'm managing on interns. Okay, this is when we're at our football block. This is when I got to be able to make calls. This is when I have volleyball. This is when I'm helping uh, clean, program, stuff like that. So I got to manage my time so much better. That's where I definitely learn going and uh, going and leaving and coming back. Yeah, it's such an important lesson. And I think when you do take on that kind of business mindset of understanding that, I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes by coaches that are, that have never known business is that college strength conditioning is a business. It is very much a business. You, now you're not bringing dollars and cents in, but wins and losses are your currency and, and relationships with your, your athletes and, and those you work with is your currency. And, you've got to run it every bit as, as refined as that. And, and so managing time, people and resources, that's the hard part. That's what we didn't, that's what we didn't learn in biology class. You know, we didn't learn those things. And so, um, you know, the only way to do that is to be involved in that. And oftentimes you don't get that chance until you're a head strength coach, you know? And yeah. So going and running a facility, you got that opportunity. And, and like I said, it, you know, there was a big difference between you know the young Fred Hale that came in that just was a gym rat versus the guy that okay I've I've led a team I've 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 had to coordinate schedules I've had to I've had to think outside of just this this one little room uh, that's on campus and uh, I think that helped you you helped you out in a big way talk a little bit about you know the other thing I think in that process was that you had to kind of find your own voice you had to kind of find you know um, who you were. And uh, Fred is one of the most humble people on the planet. He's one of the strongest people on the planet too. Uh, but he, but you would never know it from talking to him. I mean, but um, you had to find your own voice. I mean, and and you weren't going to be, you know, the, the the loud, bolsterous kind of in your face guy that I that I tended to be. Um, but you were every bit, if not more, effective. Um, with how you built your relationships with the athletes. Talk a little bit about how you um, found your voice, your coaching voice, and the way to connect with your athletes in, in, in your own unique way. Yeah, and, and it goes back to that time in Tennessee. And, and you say it, you know, in, in your talks is you spell love, T-I-M-E. And, and I, saw it, I saw it from you. Yes, you're, you know, you're this, you know, big voice and, and face of the program and all of that at Tennessee, but you don't miss on the little things. I learned that. I had to learn that. And getting to know when a guy's having a bad day, when he's sick, when his family's in trouble, something like that, and that's affecting how he's how he or she is is lifting and, and performing, that that I saw went a long, long way with the athletes. Just getting to know something that we have in common or I learned something that they love. 
you know, a lot of our athletes love, love automobiles. I started to love automobiles because of it, right. you know, fixing things, changing things. You've seen, you've seen what I have now. And, um, that's something that has gone such a, such a long way. And it's just as easy as putting your arm around, around an athlete, around a guy and, and getting to know the little things. I, I find this face to face contact is so much better than, you know, yelling at somebody across the room. Right. Now I've got to manage a room of 50 athletes. Yeah. That's how it's got to be some short, concise coaching cues, but putting your arm around somebody and, and, and spending time with them like that, I think goes a huge, goes a huge, huge way. Yeah. I would always tell people, you know, it was, it was always fun whenever we'd have visitors and they would come in and we'd hang out with them and whatnot. But then to watch them, you know, there's so many times that I would walk out and, you know, I would always have my, my moments with players individually mm -hmm as well you know i think you can't you can't be a head strength coach without doing that and being the best like you said but i would always walk by and i would talk to these visitors and be like you want to know what makes a good staff is look in fred and brian's office you know and, and guys would be pouring out i mean they would be you know 15 guys just just hanging out in the office you know and and um you know, having that genuine interest in their lives and, and being a part of that. And, and, and also knowing that, that in, in a lot of ways, that's the role of, of an assistant coach is, to, is to, to take on some of that because, you know, you're not doing the budget. You're not doing the, the, the hiring and the, and, and the evaluations and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that, that, you know, I think you did a great job with that. I would encourage uh, those listening to reach out to Fred at a conference or whatnot, just ask him, you know, what are some of the ways that he did that? Um, Cause it would help you as well. At Eastern, you guys have a unique situation now, obviously when I left, they, they made both you and Brian Fink, you know, co-head strength coaches, you know, and um, some people that's tough. I mean, I was, I was made a co-head strength coach when I first got to South Florida where I was football and the other guy was the Olympic and, I was, at, you know, it wasn't nearly as as cordial or as as seamless as as you and Brian make it. You know, um, what what's the advantages of that, and what are some of the disadvantages? I, I definitely say uh, I'll start with disadvantages, but um, disadvantages are definitely yeah. There's you got people think like yeah, you have to separate everything and everything's perfectly separate. It's honestly a constant flow, and, and sometimes yeah, that that can seem you know, crazy and honestly, like, Hey, one thing might get missed here and there. And it's, it's really, it's really hasn't been that it, it's, it's because we share the same office, the same office we were in that when you left, um, we share that same office. So nothing gets missed very much. There, there's always like, Hey, the, you know, so-and-so came in talking about this, or, you know, if we got one of us guys being in a staff meeting and one of us is down in the, the weight room, run the group that, that can happen. That's a, that's something we're able to do. Um, honestly, I don't see, we haven't had that huge bump in the road where this has been a disadvantage. Uh, it, it, we, we work well together. We complement each other. You know, we're able to bounce those ideas off each other and go and, and, and go and get the job done. Well, what would you say the advantage is then? I, I, I just, just those exact, those, those times where we're able to bring, put our two heads together and map out an entire program and not have those, I think we should do this. I think we should do this. I think catching Olympic lifts are a bad thing. I think doing trap bar is a bad thing. We don't have that. Because we were able to work under you and, you know, our experiences at small schools and not having a whole lot, we've been able to move forward from that and build from what we've, from our experiences from that. Yeah, I think something that I would add to that, just seeing you guys work and, and whatnot is, um, you know, obviously you can reach a player a different way than Brian can you know, and vice versa. And so I think sometimes as a head strength coach and being a singular head strength coach, you know, you can't reach all 105 guys. It's almost impossible, you know? And, and, and so I would have to lean on you guys heavily as assistants to go do that. But there's, you know, there's always the guy that's like, I don't, you know, that's an assistant. What does he know? You know, type of thing. Mm -hmm. When you guys are co-head strength coaches, I think what's nice is you, Brian might be, might, might have a better relationship with, with this guy or you might have a better relationship with that guy and it, and, it, and you're able to kind of take lead um, yeah. yield to one another you know and have the same authority um positionally to, to carry those things out you know so i think that that's a, a powerful part as well 
with uh, you know in the last six eight months it's been a whirlwind up there with building a brand new facility you know and what people don't realize you mentioned it at the beginning with coming in at Tennessee like you know, we built a 20,000 square foot weight room during a season you know and um, and during an off season and so managing off season training and in season uh, uh, scheduling and whatnot you know that's that's not easy to do with building the facility what are some things, what are some lessons learned, you know, that maybe the, the head strength coach that hasn't yet built a facility or the, the assistant strength coach that's not even thinking about that yet, what are some things that they need to be doing now to get ready for when they're, you know, all of a sudden they sit in front of an AD and they're like, okay, you got $5 million to build a weight room, go. Mm -hmm. no, it, seeing that, like you said, yeah, the 20,000 square foot, it, it – it showed exactly what you didn't like, what, what did work. And to speak to the assistant that is that gym rat or train in on, when they go to a conference, train on every single little piece. Remember how those things feel. Remember those, what you like, what you don't like, what this looks like, what the, you know, again, that could change five years down the road, but you just have an experience on that piece. So you can confidently and, and speak on those, those terms with those people and with your ADs have a list of everything you saw, you liked, you know, the prices, if you can find them, talking to these people, get to know these vendors, cause they can be your friend long way down the road. They can help you out. Um, to the head, to the head, uh, head person that hasn't built one yet, fight the good fight every single day. Be in contact, know who your people are on the ground, on the ground floor with, you know, when it comes to, okay, this is getting, the concrete's getting poured today. The posts are going in. The, uh, the walls are getting put up. The glass is getting put in. When they're at the very start and everything is on paper, fight the good fight and make sure that you're not getting something in there that you don't want. You don't want an L-shaped room. You don't want pillars, you know, on every single, <laughs> in every single corner of the room, which section it off. Fight that good fight every day. Get in that ADZ or that you're not going to back down really on a lot of this. If they can't do it, find a way. Yeah, I think, you know, and you know, obviously I haven't been uh, – I've been more privy to your guys' situation than probably, you know, than, than most. But, um, you know, what, what goes into that, I think, is being prepared and having an understanding of the process as much as you can beforehand. So even, you know, one of our, one of our intern assignments was creating that, that layout of a weight room way back when, you know, and – um, doing it with a one by one, you know, a square foot by square, foot, a square foot uh, cell on Excel and putting in and having to go see what equipment was and mm -hmm. learn about traffic flow and safety zones and, and those types of things. And, and um, so doing as much of that on the front end as, as, a, as, a, as an exercise, I think yeah. it's always good. I think, um, like you mentioned, you know, really developing relationships with vendors um, and, um, you know, trying things out is always good. Uh, but you gotta know what you, you know, you gotta know what you would want and why you want it. And it can't just be because I like it, you know, it's gotta be because it's, it, there's a function there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the last thing you said that I think was really good was, you know, if you have a contentious relationship with your AD, your, um, you know, your president, your, uh, building foreman, your supervisor, you know, any of those people, then there's a lot of decisions that you can be left out of, or you can be a part of, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, being an active part of that process and, and, and follow it up and saying, and being a squeaky wheel and always, you know, kind of being in the air, things don't get missed that way. But if you're doing it in a positive way and fighting the good fight, like you say, um, then people want to, to help you. They want to make sure that you have what you want, you know, and, and, uh, or it could be an afterthought. It's like, here you go. There's your room. Yeah. I think it's important, obviously, as you go. Well, man, we, we end the episode with um, some resources here. Give us the best piece of coaching advice you ever received. Don't be a human cone. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Who gave you that one? I believe it was you and Angelo. <laughs> on my first week. That was actually a Derek Dooley quote. That was a Derek Dooley quote uh -huh. that, I would, that I would use. But 
but don't be a human cone. What's that mean? Explain that to everybody. If if you're just gonna be, you know, what does a cone do? A cone sits there. It it takes up space. It's not helping. It's not hold anything. It's 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 just taking up space. You're there. You're brought in, especially as in as intern. You're you're there to learn. You're there to coach. You're there to be a sponge, absorb. You know, create your own way. And being a human cone, you can't do that. I love it. I love it. Give us a uh, book, app, and website recommendation. Uh, this is the one I just did for my uh, marriage counseling, but it was fan or follower. Uh, it's about people that, you know, they believe in Jesus. They believe that at the end of the day that they're going to go to heaven, but they just kind of do the same mundane things all the time. Um, are you a fan and just everything's good and you're going to be, hey, everything's great and say, okay, or when the bad things come, are you still going to be a, a follower? Right. That's something that's definitely opened my eyes to, you know, where I am on my walk with Jesus uh, and how I, how I need to change that or, you know, continue on the route I'm on. So right. that's a, definitely a good book recommendation for anybody at any point. Right. Uh, website, Zach DeChant, uh, he's a strength coach down at TCU works primarily with baseball, but has a great, great website. A lot of good information he has on his website. Um, and an app, other than Play Pro, Play Pro is something everyone's got to check out. Uh, that's a website as well, too. Uh, but Clarity is a money app. Uh, you link it to you know, your spending accounts, and it shows you where your leaks are coming from. You, know, you want to plug those leaks, make sure you're not losing any money. Uh, down the road, but it shows you the the stuff you're bought into. So your monthly subs subscriptions. So if it's Spotify, if it's iTunes, you know Netflix, whatever it is, it, it shows you where you're spend spending at and where you can cut down at. Yeah, all I, I love. First of all, I love the fan or follower because so many people just read strength and conditioning books and have nothing. You know, I mean, you're talking about how not only does that strengthen your your walk spiritually, but as you're getting ready to get married to. A, a lovely lady we all love, Val. Um, I think if you're home, uh, you, you heard me say this a million times. If your home team is not right, then you, you have no chance to get your team right. And um, I think that that's so so important. Um, I love the fact that you're talking clarity and and again an app that has to do with plugging leaks. That was something that we'd always talk about as well about making sure that you're not just looking for additional income, but you're also plugging leaks where money's going out um so again so many strength coaches are not doing those things uh and then zach's been on the show and just a great you know great um yeah. strength coach as well so that's that's fantastic man like i said at the beginning i mean uh, you know a by far one of my favorite people on the planet just a guy that's that um i i have so much respect for uh, your humility um the way you go about things is, is unreal and and um Proud of you, but I'm also proud to, to call you a friend, man. I appreciate it, Coach. You've been a huge influence on my life. Almost, yes, a, a big brother, father figure, the whole deal. Um, just going as deep as your, you know, or your kids and I have a similar background. So that's a huge help. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefer. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.